Let's turn to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Last, uh, the last several weeks we've looked at, uh, at uh, chapter 13. We looked at smit- smitting ourselves to governor, our government. Actually, starting in verse, or chapter 12, we talked about our vertical relationship with God. Then we began talking about how we are to serve the church. We talked about relationships with, uh, with our government how we are to this horizontal relationship that we live in, and also about loving our neighbor. <clears throat> and then we finished off with putting on Christ, verse 11 through verse 14 of chapter 13. Today, we're going into the law of liberty, the law of liberty. And we're going to be looking at the very first part of this. Uh, it's, this whole section is, is talking about the weak and the strong on, deba- on debated, debated matters or on disputed matters. The weak and the strong on debated matters. And this is chapter 14 through chapter 15, verse 13. Uh, There's just too much information there to cover tonight, so we'll get as far as we can. But I want to start off with a background. A background. Now, please, if you have a question, just raise your hand and let me know. We have a microphone here, and the microphone is for the benefit of those who are following us online so they can actually hear your question. And uh, so please don't be intimidated. who knows? Maybe you'll go viral. The Lord knows. <laughs> forgive me, folks. For those of you who understand, I don't know if you guys, virals is this. Well, forget it. Anyhow, Romans chapter 14 through 15, verse 13 is Paul's pastoral response to a problem in Rome. I've, I've learned some things as I studied this myself, and though I have studied Romans for a number of years, this was not quite brought out to, to me in this particular way. You see, the background history here is that the Emperor Claudius expelled all Jews from Rome in AD 49. He kicked them out. There was a lot of strife and division between the synagogues, and partly because of the gospel. And this is when the gospel reached Rome, there were several synagogues there. Some accepted and some rejected teachings about Jesus. This led to clashes between the synagogues. They began to argue and dispute with one another in more forceful ways. As a result, Claudius forced thousands of Jews to leave Rome, including Christians and non-Christian Jews. So it was the Jewish population. Jews were allowed to return five years later when Nero began to rule in AD 54. So in AD 54, the Jews went back to Rome, were allowed to come back in. As the Jews returned, they became part of the various communities of believers in Rome so when Paul wrote just three years later in A.D. 57, he, he showed great concern for Jews returning, or re-entering rather, the churches in Rome where Gentiles were the majority. So all of a sudden you have a mixed congregation. You have Jews and you have Gentiles. For five years, the church was Gentile. Gentile meaning non-Jew. And then all of a sudden, an influx of Christian Jews that came back to Rome are entering into the communities of faith. There were several of them meeting in people's homes or wherever they met. And all of a sudden, there began to be, once again, within the community, the Christian community, disputes and arguments. What we see here in Paul's words in this particular passage that we're going to be looking at over the next couple days, it sort of echoes what he mentioned in Romans chapter 11, verses 17 through 21, Gentiles who have been grafted in should not be arrogant towards Jews. Christians that have been grafted in should not be arrogant towards Jews. So what happened? Tensions rose. As Jewish and Gentile believers mixed in communities and home churches, their backgrounds, traditions, and culture were different. Jews grew up following the law of Moses. Jews divided all food into two categories, clean and clean, according to Leviticus chapter 11. So when they ate, they ate food that they considered clean or kosher, and they avoided unclean food. And even food that they were permitted to eat, if it was not prepared properly, it was considered unclean, and so they could not eat it. For example, some meat, such as pork, was always unclean, because although a pig had a split hoof, it did not chew the cud. Other meat, such as beef or lamb, was clean if it was killed in the right way and cooked with clean hands and clean pots. So they came in with this tradition back into the Gentile churches, 
And the Gentiles did not have the same background. They did not have the same traditions. They didn't have the same culture. People who touched unclean animals were unclean until purified, according to the Jews. In the same way, a pot that a lizard fell into was unclean and had to be broken. Leviticus 11.33, right there. So a Jew might lack a clear conscience to eat meat if he was uncertain of how the meat was slaughtered or prepared or cooked. So they had a hard time. Uh, they could be invited over to a Gentile's home, and they go into that home, and yet they have this tradition that is hanging heavily upon them, and all of a sudden they, there, there's a conflict of conscience because most of the Jews, there were very few at this time, that had been raised in Christianity from the time of their childhood. There were some, obviously. There were some younger ones that were children and teenagers that may have come in that first wave of, of salvation, being their parents getting uh, accepting Jesus Christ and, 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 and embracing Christ as their Messiah. And thus they were raised in, Christian, in a Christian environment, but they were still influenced by their Jewish traditions. And then the gospel began to spread around the Roman Empire. In contrast, most Gentiles did not grow up with the rules about eating. They felt free to eat whatever, wherever. They weren't inhibited. Therefore, when Paul mentions believers who are strong in faith, he is referring to the Gentiles in this context. And we'll explain what that word strong and weak means, okay? So that you'll, you'll understand in a second. So when he's talking about those who are strong in the faith, he's... Or in, in faith, he is referring to the Gentiles. Their faith was not affected by rules about eating. Their faith wasn't intimidated or hindered. However, in contrast, as I've already shared, the Jewish believers lacked faith to eat meat from the marketplace for the very reasons. They didn't know how it was slaughtered. They didn't know how it was prepared. Their faith was troubled by the command, you must not eat meat that is unclean for you. Again, Leviticus 11, verse 8. Verse eight. Now, you remember <coughs> the story of Daniel and his three friends. In Babylon, Daniel resolved in his heart not to defy himself with the royal food and the royal wine. He did not want to defile himself. Why? Because of the scruples that they had that was birthed out of the Pentateuch and the law of Moses. And they did not want that to happen. In Babylon, Gentiles would have stood in line to get free meat and wine from Nebuchadnezzar's palace. But Daniel and his three friends refused to eat it. Their consciences protested. I said, we are not going to defile ourselves. For even the best food was unclean if prepared by unclean hands or unclean dishes. For Jews, food that was unclean, uh, food that was clean and kosher had to pass the test of Leviticus 11. And you know, you've, you've seen uh, you, uh, kosher, uh, the Jewish... Uh, uh, butcher shops, uh, you'll see from time to time food in the, in the supermarkets that'll have the word kosher um, on it, just like they have for the Muslim faith, for those who have to have their food blessed by an imam, the Jews having it blessed by a rabbi, just a lot of different things where the traditions and the culture that surround that thing, uh, it, it is still something that is very, very live and vivid in uh, the Jewish world, in the, uh, those who are followers of the law of Moses. Likewise, Jewish believers had weak faith about certain days, such as the Sabbath and feast days. So what, what, we're, what we're seeing here is that for the Jewish people, when he's talking about weak in faith, he is talking about the Jewish believers. Now again, give me a moment and we'll cl clarify the word faith and what that means in this context. In contrast, a Gentile's conscience did not regard one day holier than another. So obviously for the Jew, the Sabbath was their Saturday, and it started Friday evening when the sun went down until the sun went down on Saturday. And so that was a time where they ingrained into their personhood was the traditions that surrounded, uh, surrounded their, uh, their, 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 their faith that they came out of. And so... They had this ongoing struggle of conscience. 
conscience, our conscience judges on the basis of what it has been taught. Our consciences. So when you look at someone who is a Muslim, and you wonder, how can they be like that? Why can't they see Christ as the answer to their problems? It's because they have been raised from their earliest days in a system that has taught them and given them a world religious view. And that's not something people can shake in one hearing of the gospel. Now, miracles can happen. Don't get me wrong. A vision can happen. Something can happen. Or maybe disappointment because of some of the things. It's the same, same is true with the Jewish people. They have a tradition. They have a way of doing things that they have grown up with from the time that they're old enough to stand. Uh, and, and when they every Friday night, the Seder meal, uh, they would they would uh, they would uh, have celebrate uh, the the Sabbath. I don't know if it's a Seder meal, but they would celebrate uh, the Sabbath, and have a meal, and that would happen every Friday night as the sun was going down. And so they had traditions that they grew up with. Now imagine, look at your own lives, the traditions that you grew up with. It's hard to let go of our traditions in order to respect the traditions that are different than ours, and yet we both serve the same God. And speaking of Christians, we both serve the same God, but we have traditions that are not parallel. Why? Because our traditions are often dictated to us by our culture. And I'm not saying culture is always right, but it's not always wrong either. It's just different. It's just different. And so for us in this particular situation, as we're looking at this, Paul is talking about a law of liberty, something that that we have to understand if we're going to be able to live at peace with those who are not in the same place as we are or operate in the same way. Some Jews like Paul had a conscience that had learned more than others. As Paul grew in knowledge and faith, God taught him that no food is unclean in itself. We see that in verse 14 of chapter uh, Romans chapter 14. Elsewhere, Paul wrote that under the new covenant, all foods may be eaten. For, there, for they are made holy by the word of God and prayer, according to 1 Timothy 4, 5. Paul grew in knowledge to understand the Lord's teachings. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean. This is Jesus speaking. But what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Well, folks, this is a lesson that we need to learn as believers in Christ. You might wear the appropriate clothing. You might wear the appropriate the uh, act in a, in a particular way, and you might say, "No, you can't eat this. You can't eat that. You can't drink this. You can't drink that." But it's, that is not what makes us unclean. What makes us unclean is when we allow our mouth to speak forth things that are wicked and unholy and ungodly. So Paul is telling us here, or Jesus rather, is telling us in Matthew 15, 11, that it's not what we put in that makes us unclean, but it's what comes out. In contrast, some Gentile converts to Judaism and many Jewish believers still had a conscience taught by Moses. These believers had not yet discovered that in Christ, lower laws are replaced by higher laws. Lower laws are replaced by higher laws. As we prepare to study this passage, it is important to discern three types of issues, or three types of matters, if I can say it that way. They are as, as follow. The first primary level is core beliefs of Christianity. The core beliefs of Christianity. The second level is disputed matters in the faith. And underneath that is beliefs of a particular denomination. And the third is matters outside the faith. You see, we can have a lot of disagreements on level two and three here, but on level one, we have to be in accord. We have to be in accord across the board. But the level two and level three beliefs are beliefs that, that, that uh, we may have divergent ideas and different interpretations of what the Scripture is saying. The primary issues consist of the core beliefs of the faith that are essential of Christianity. In Romans chapter 1 through 8, Paul deals with some of the basic matters of the faith. 
teaching that we, sh- that we would fall under this first point, this first thing, the core beliefs of Christianity. And these would be inspiration of Scripture, the one true God, the deity of Christ, the lostness of man, salvation through faith in Christ who died for our sins and rose for our justification, the ministry of the Holy Spirit for holy living, water baptism, communion, the church and its mission, the second coming of Christ, the final judgment. If one denies any of these basic doctrines, he denies the faith. You see, the first level, the primary issues, are things that we have to embrace from God's word. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6-9, through 9, Paul condemns those who preach a different gospel. Those who preach a different gospel. The first level, as it were, is not something we dispute or debate. Rather, the gospel is part of the core of Christianity. We cannot debate the idea, is Jesus truly the redemptor of all humanity and the only redemptor? When Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father except by me. And so there are certain issues in the core principles and the core beliefs of Christianity that Christian, Christians who we would call Orthodox Christians or Christians who are Evangelical Orthodox. I have to add that now because there's a lot of Evangelical Christians that are off the rails in their doctrine. Evangelical Orthodox Christians, we, have, we, 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 we are on the same page almost when there are divergence. It's usually divergence from groups or groups within other groups that begin to teach and and preach things that are not part of the core, as if it were core beliefs of Christianity. Or they deform the core beliefs of Christianity, and they steal or rob it of its power and its message. Some in Galatia were teaching that our salvation is based on obeying the law. The law of who? The law of Moses. These Judaizers taught that we earn points with God and win his favor with our deeds. And Paul talks about that in chapter 3 of Galatians, verses 1 through 14. Trusting in deeds, we trusting in deeds, we do as we if we do trust in our deeds, it's futile and it's heresy. Heresy is believing something else can save you other than Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. And teaching it. In contrast, Paul emphasizes that offering ourselves as a living sacrifice is the way true believers respond to God's gift of salvation in Christ. We see that in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. In a similar way, Paul warned believers in Colossus to let no one judge them on matters of eating, drinking, or special days. And that was in chapter 2, verses 16 through 19. You can see where, where the Colossians and, and also the Romans and the Galatians, there, there were Judaizers that were coming in and saying, you have to follow the law of Moses in order to truly be saved. And Paul, as we've already talked about, and, uh, when, they, when they said to the Jews that you have to be circumcised, or they said to the Gentiles, you need to be circumcised. Circumcision is the answer to your problems. That's how you're going to be truly saved. Paul repudiated it. You see, what they were trying to do is to add to salvation. See, legalism, as it is described in God's Word, not in man's uh, preemptive or after-the-fact interpretation of the word legalism, is to take the Word of God that is contained and say, this is how you get saved, by doing this, 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 and that when it's apart from Jesus Christ. Or they say, you need Jesus, but you need this also. It's adding to one's salvation. If you're going to be saved, you have to do this. If you're going to be saved, you can't do that. So it's a work, believe. It's like a 50-50 situation. Jesus does 50% of it, and you do 50% of it. It's a work salvation. And that's not what Jesus came for. And that's not what Paul taught or the other apostles false teachers at Colossus were basing salvation on works and human experiences 
In contrast, the issues among Roman believers were on the second and third levels. They weren't on the core beliefs. That's not where they were arguing about or having arguments. It was on the secondary issues. The secondary issues. I just want to just highlight one second here. Human experiences. If your human experience or that moment that you, however you were touched, you were wowed or whatever the situation was, and I'm not mocking because I've had experiences, spiritual touches from God, emotional responses to the working of God. If those human experiences don't draw you further into the truth and start causing you and creating in you thoughts and teachings that are not biblically based, then we need to, those experiences weren't from God. Or if they were from God, we distorted it. And I remember, I remember the experiences for me when someone had a experience with the Holy Ghost. I always looked for the, the fruit of it. What's the fruit of it? Is their life changed? Has something happened? Are they doing the same thing they used to do? Have they been changed? And there were times I saw dramatic change. I mean, prideful people, humbled and walking in humility before God and man. I mean, I, I was blown away. And then there were other times uh, people would go through the machinations of, Ooh, and they would fall out and they would get up and they would live just like they did before. There was nothing there. I saw one guy take off, boom, lit up the auditorium, running around. And I knew that particular individual wouldn't do that unless the power of God had truly hit him because he was just too proud. His name was Philip. <laughs> he lost his girlfriend because his girlfriend didn't want someone like that. She didn't want to associate with a crazy. But I can guarantee you before, every hair was in place impeccable, and it was still in place. He didn't lose some of the practical things that he had. But what wasn't attached to that was pride and arrogance, like I'm better than everyone else around me. And God touched his life, and I'm like, whoa, I saw that. And the reason why I was able to, to, to witness it on a daily basis is because he lived right across the hall from me in the dorms. He was a changed man because he had a real encounter with God, and it drew him closer to the Lord. And so a lot of times people will try to use their experience to make doctrine when their experiences have nothing based in the Word of God. It's important that, that we don't base our faith on what God does for us in these special moments. Oh, he didn't touch me today. You know, I've been in a church service. The Spirit of God is moving. I mean, folks, I was looking at people all around me, and they're getting blessed. There I am as cold as an ice cube, and I'm looking at all these people, and they're getting blessed. They're raising their hands. They're weeping. They're crying out to the Lord. It's not done it was done in an orderly manner, and they were worshiping God, and there I was as cold as an ice cube, and I'm thinking, God, what is wrong with me? At least I recognized the thing, that there was something blocking me. Maybe the Lord allowed me to have that experience just so that I could know. Because I've had other people, well, the Lord wasn't here today. He didn't touch me. He wasn't there. Those other people were just acting. That's all because he didn't touch me. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? The Lord didn't touch me, and since he didn't touch me, that was just all a bunch of fake and not real stuff. But sometimes our hearts maybe are ready to receive from the Lord. Maybe sometimes they're not. Maybe we come in with things that prevent us from receiving from the Lord, but don't judge others around you for what God is doing in their hearts and in their lives because they're responding in a particular way. Secondary issues consist of de debated matters of faith, which are not the essential matters of Christianity. By debated, matter, debated matters of faith, we mean matters on which true believers have different opinions. True believers have different opinions. Even sincere, mature, godly, spirit-filled believers do not agree on all matters of faith or conduct. We don't all agree on everything 100%. In our passage, we find these debated matters included eating meat, drinking wine, and honoring one another above, honoring one day rather, above another. These issues 
become secondary, and I'm not saying they're not important, but they're not something that is going to directly impact one's spirituality and relationship with God unless they're doing something that the Lord has told them not to do. You understand what I'm saying? We have to live with our conscience. We have to live with what God has spoken to us. You see, unity on issues from the second level is not necessary for salvation. And subtracting them does not reduce Christianity. Not doing them or doing them. Oh, you got to do this or, or you got to do that. Women, you have to have your hair. You never cut your hair. It has to go all the way down to the ground. And then you have to weave it up into a beehive about a foot and a half or two above your head. Men, you have to, you have to shave. You, you have to shave. Show me the burst. Well, it's tradition. Just everybody here. It's being clean cut. That's the way we're supposed to be as Christians. There's a whole bunch of things that are secondary issues that we, unfortunately, a lot of people don't have the maturity and make them first primary issues that impact their faith and say, you can't be a Christian if you don't do this or if you do that. Today it matters. It matters on the second level. Our secondary issues include choices people make about hair, dress, and music. And they include beliefs that mark a particular denomination or fellowship. Now, folks, we need to be sensitive not to be influenced by the world. You get that. The Bible says that very clearly. Um, be not conformed to this world. And we know that if we're listening to, to things from the world, whether it be music, movies, or whatever, that influence our faith and, and either weaken it or compromise it, then we know that we're supposed to set aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, according to Hebrews chapter 12. For example, regarding the secondary issues, most of us Pentecostals teach the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the outward evidence of speaking in tongues. We emphasize that being filled with the Spirit increases power to witness, victorious living, godliness, and perseverance. Still, we believe that it is possible to be born again and reach heaven without being baptized in the Holy Spirit as we interpret it from God's Word. I have many friends who are not Pentecostals and I have had in the past, that are not Pentecostals, that I believe have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, and if they were to die today, they would go straight to glory. And they would see Jesus face to face. Does that diminish the value of what I sense God's Word telling me? The Bible doesn't say be baptized in the Holy Spirit so that you can be saved. Jesus is the one who saves us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, as we interpret it as Pentecostals, is to empower us for witness. It's not just to run around and, 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 and speak in tongues, but it's to empower us for victorious living. And, and I would say, in this sense, as we look at Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, it is to be a witness to our world, our our. our, our, our our Judea, our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, Galilee, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, someone who's truly baptized in the Holy Spirit is not just speaking in tongues, but he is living a life that reaches out to the world. He's living a life that is empowered by the Holy Spirit to continue to persevere. But you know what? Those who are not baptized in the Holy Spirit, as we interpret it as Pentecostals, the Holy Spirit still dwells in them. Because Romans tells us that if the Spirit is not in them, then they are not part of the family of God. So when they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in and takes up residence in their lives. And they can manifest the fruits of the Spirit. They can live a life that is pleasing to God. They can, folks. I've seen it. I've lived it as a Baptist boy growing up through my teenage years, seeing men and women of God I just wanted all that God had for me. I didn't want to go halfway. I wanted to go all the way. And that's the reason why I began to seek God and the fullness of his spirit. Other topics that are on this secondary level could be uh, 
the different creation theories that are out there, the age of the earth, uh, the time of the rapture, and other views on the millennium. And, and, and the list can go on a little bit. See, these issues and how we believe them does not impact our salvation because our salvation is, who saves us? Jesus. Jesus saves us. Are you following with me, folks, who are online? Jesus is the one who saves us. Secondary issues are divided into, into two, two halves. The first half refers to beliefs of a, of a denomination or a group of churches. Some of the beliefs of a denomination may be debated, especially outside the denomination. And we see that from time to time. You, you go on YouTube, you can find anything you want. You know, why you shouldn't speak in tongues, why you should speak in tongues. Why do you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You're already baptized in the Holy Spirit. I mean, all types of debates and all types of things. It is good for believers to search the scriptures and become members of a denomination that they can support, that you have a lot of things that you share together. I came into the Assemblies of God, first of all, because they believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and secondary, they were missions-minded. And I had received a call from God to serve the Lord as a missionary. And so when I decided that I would integrate into the assemblies of God, it was for those two reasons. And the rest of the doctrines fell in place for me. The rest of the doctrines fell in place for me. When believers in a denomination agree on doctrines and priorities, they have unity and strength. There is strength in unity. There is strength in unity. And even though you may not be in total agreement with other denominations or other fellowships in, in your immediate area or on a more national world level, it doesn't mean that they are necessarily off the rails. It just means that in the secondary issues, there's a difference. There's a difference. We must remember that there are true believers in various denominations so if we debate or discuss biblical topics with believers from different denominations, we should not be judgmental if they do not agree with us on secondary issues. You're an idiot. I can't believe you believe that. You know how that would make you feel if someone spoke that to you? Well, imagine you speaking to someone else. It doesn't really help to convince them or to show why you believe a certain thing on a secondary issue. You see, there's like, from what I'm understanding right now, you have pre-trib, Pre-judgment, mid-trib, and post-trib. Those are the three, the three, the four, the four things going. And then you have people who don't believe in any trib, or the trib is coming, but we're stuck through the whole thing, and Jesus is going to come, and we'll go with him through the millennial. And so there's a lot of different views that people hold. The assemblies of God, we believe in the pre-trib rapture of the church. And we have our reasons why we believe that. But I tell people, yes, and I can argue and I can try to convince you from God's word and see the same scriptures that we use for one position can actually in some cases be used for another position. What Jesus said is, occupy till I come. Do you hear that, that, that trumpet sound? If Jesus comes before, praise God. If he comes pre-judgment, hallelujah. If he comes mid-trib, Oh my, if he comes post-trib, Lord, give me strength. You know, whatever it is, we need to occupy until he comes. We need to be busy about his work. Occupy till he comes. Let us show love and respect to sincere believers who interpret the Bible differently than we do. And let us speak the truth as we see it in love according to Ephesians 4.15. As Paul wrote, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He says that in verse 5 of Romans 14. It is not necessary for us to persuade one another to believe exactly as we do. You see, we're not a bunch of cookie-cutter Christians where everybody has the same shape and the same beliefs on every single matter. There are differences, different ways of approaching God's Word and, and interpreting God's word on the secondary issues. The primary issues, folks, that, that is so clear for me. That's what I, the way I see it. And when you would look at a, a, at a list of doctrines from a Baptist church and an Assembly of God church, on the primary issues, you would see that there is unity. 
there. We believe in the Trinity. We believe in salvation through Christ alone. We believe in the Holy Spirit's sanctifying work. There are so many different things that we are in agreement with. We believe in baptism. And even in the issue of baptism, though that is a primary thing, there are some differences. And, uh, you know, in the end, God's going to iron it all out. He's going to work it all out. He's going to work it out. But we know some beautiful Reformed Christians that were missionaries in Haiti, and their daughters were sprinkled when they were babies. However, they testified at a baptismal without being rebaptized, but they testified to God's saving grace in their lives. They gave a public testimony of their embracing Christianity. And so, you know, I looked at that. He says, well, that's not the way, way I, I understand it. I understand immersion. And there's another church when they, I saw a baby, a baby, being dunked in a Greek Orthodox style church three times all the way. And the water probably was not heated because the baby was wailing like crazy. I mean, fully dunked. Just like that, three times. <laughs> Someone showed me the YouTube video. I'm thinking, wow, if that baby's not saved <laughs> after that, I'm just joking. Okay, don't take me seriously. Don't quote me saying Pastor Steve has gone off the rails. It's not the case. We must fellowship with believers from various denominations if we agree on the matters of premier importance to our faith. We can. We can fellowship with people. And I am so thankful that that the, the churches that I grew up in who were very close to other groups, matter of fact, almost to the point of excluding everyone else except them going to heaven, uh, that many of them have opened up to churches and fellowship between Lutheran churches that preach the gospel and hold to the fundamental truths of the faith, Baptist and Presbyterian. Not all Presbyterians are out, out to lunch. We have a lot of good churches where they preach the gospel. And uh, so let's not allow ourselves to become judgmental because of the secondary issues. Some err by insisting that fellowship depends on agreement with secondary issues. God help us. God help us. That's going to be a little hard when we're all up in heaven, huh? We'll all be gathered around the throne, the word of God says, of every tongue and tribe and nation. And I'll be standing next to people of different churches. You know, there'll be some Greek Orthodox there. There'll even be some Roman Catholics. Can you believe that? Forgive me if that offends you. There are some Roman Catholics that understand salvation. They do. Matter of fact, even more than some Protestants do. And they're not depending on Mary for their salvation. Well, then they should leave the abomination of desolation and get out of the church. Some of them, and I've talked to them, have stayed in because they want to witness and bring people to a saving faith in Christ. A saving faith in Christ. I'm not saying all their theology is, is on the same line, but if their faith is placed in Jesus Christ and they're not performing idolatry, and putting their faith and trust in saints and all that type of stuff, and they're keeping their eyes focused on the Word of God. If you go to the Charismatic Catholic Renewal, you can see in their belief statement, it would be like you were reading it out of an evangelical uh, movement. Not to say that they, they have everything, and all those who are charismatic or spirit-filled in the Catholic Church are where they need to be, particularly on the, the, the fundamental or primary issues. But they're moving in the right direction, and that's my prayer they'll continue. And I know that sometimes the Catholic Church has tried to bring them back into the fold completely and embracing all this extra flu that's come over the church. See, a lot of people will say, well, I just can't depend on the Word of God, sola scriptura, only scriptures. I have to believe in tradition as well, church tradition. But we know that church tradition can be manipulated by men who are not godly. But God's word, if we're being led and directed by the Holy Spirit, he'll lead us into all truth. 
the Holy Spirit will. The third level consists of matters outside the faith that a non-religious that are non-religious issues, such as math, the sciences, government, health issues, like vaccinations and circumcision and technology. It is important to note that forms of government and political parties are not matters of faith. Oh, <clears throat> can't be a Christian if you're part of this political party. In Belgium, I don't know how many political parties they have, but when you look at their boards as they're, they're coming up to an election, there's like 800 faces you know, spread across these things. They have, they have over 40 or 50 political parties. And I can imagine in the church that there are people that belong to different parties. So their Christianity is not attached to the political party. Now, don't get me wrong. We need, to, we need to look at a political party and see what they're promoting. And we need to be wise as believers to make sure that we are not, by voting for them, promoting things that are contrary to God's word. Do you understand me? Are you following me online? That's the way it needs to be. Health issues, uh, governmental issues, churches run are run differently. They have a different governmental structure. Uh, did you know that the Assemblies of God around the world, the different churches, are not all run the same way as the Assemblies of God here in America are run? There are some that were not birthed by the Assemblies of God USA. One of those churches is the church in France. They were birthed by a British minister who was going to Africa, but stopped in France and La Havre to study French on the northwest side of the country. And there, Douglas Scott, he started learning French, but he was so filled with the fire of evangelism that he began to preach in French, and they told me that he was so bad. His French was so bad that sometimes, he, instead of telling people to come in, when he would see them standing in the back, he would say, get out. <laughs> but what happened, what happened is that the power of God was manifested in ministry. There were healings and miracles and things of that nature, and the church was birthed in the fire of Pentecost, but it wasn't an American missionary. So the way that they do government, the way that they even do biblical training is not the same as what we do here in America in the Assemblies of God. So what I'm saying is, is that every church has to is, is developing and growing and moving forward. Now, it caused conflicts, secondary issues, caused conflicts on the field. How do you train Africans when you have American missionaries there and French missionaries there? And this was from talking with a missionary who was a, a pastor who I worked with who was a missionary in Africa. And then I talked to a superintendent of the National Church of Ivory Coast. As they say in French, Côte d'Ivoire. Ivoire. And there I was talking to him. I said, well, tell me about how this relationship is between the missionaries and all that. He said, you know what? They were arguing about our Bible school. The French were saying we should have no formal training. Just put them out there in ministry and let them go and have someone supervise them and do all that. And where the Americans are saying, we need four years of Bible school where they can get all this training and then go out. And it was causing a lot of heated debate among the missionaries and it was causing frustration for the National Church. And finally, they just put all, brought them all together and said, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the best of the French program and we're going to take the best of the American program, and we're going to marry them together. Two years in Bible school, and then a two-year stage or internship where you go and you work under a pastor, and if you don't plan a church in two years, then you may not be called. And the church in Cote d'Ivoire at that time, or in Ivory Coast at that time, had grown to over 5,000 churches. You see, on secondary issues, sometimes we can get, we can butt heads, and we can say, you're doing it wrong, we're doing it right, you should do this, or you should do that. And in reality, God has his thing for everybody. You know, I had to deal with that, too, as a missionary. Culturally different. Not the same, but not wrong. The Lord, the Lord blessed me to be in a third world country and then to minister in a first world country in France and then later Belgium. 
And so to be able to see the two different venues, to be able to see how they do things in two different countries, three different countries actually, and all three countries different, different in the way that they recognize pastors, different in the way that they ran their national office, different in a myriad of ways, totally different. And I would have to say that in France, though, the church, the, the Assemblies of God is not a perfect church. It has done a great job in reaching the population in regards to the gospel compared to other fellowships. They're the largest, if I'm not mistaking, other than the what we call the Gypsy Church, where there's been a great revival there. And the Gypsy Church and the Assemblies of God are fraternal or, uh, or sister movements going side by side, and they have fellowship from time to time. But they believe pretty much the same thing. And they're touching, my guess is around 500,000 people all together, the two movements. And so I'm thankful for that. In a country of 66 million, it's not represent, a representative of a lot, a lot of people. Not quite 1% of the population. But God is working and God is moving. And they've had, they've had to work through their issues. They've had to work through having American missionaries that come there with our ideas from the U.S., straight from the U.S. And, you know, if you did this and you did that, things would be better for your church and, you know, you'd really be able to grow. And, and, and with some idea thinking that we could transplant our way of doing things into their culture and their society, even though we look a lot alike, international community, a country with a metropolitan or, or mosaic of cultures and races and foreigners, just like America, but different, different. These things that I mentioned on the third level, they're not a part of Christianity. However, our relationship to government is a matter of faith, which Paul addressed in chapter 13 of Romans, are the importance to obey our governing authorities. As we have just reviewed the background of Romans 14 through 15, 13, we must understand that Paul is speaking about deba debated matters of faith. He's not talking about core issues. Now let us examine three principles for relating to each other on matters that are secondary, and we're not going to go through all three tonight. <clears throat> and I know that... Uh, we haven't read the scripture in its totality. We'll do that and we'll probably finish. I'll finish with the point, then we'll read the scriptures, and next week we'll come back to the commentary on the scriptures read, and then we'll go to point two and point three as well. So the first point on how to relate together with other believers on secondary issues is, is accept one another on debatable, disputable matters in the faith. Do not judge. Do not judge. Romans 14, verses 1 through 12 say, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but do not dispute over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, we will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Important point, just real quick here. God is the only one that has given permission to judge on secondary issues. Only God. We're not called to be to stand in God's shoes and judge our brothers and sisters on secondary issues. Verse 5, one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he who does not eat to the Lord he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We belong to him. 
For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and in some translations, God's judgment seat. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give account to, of himself to God. You see, I can point the finger in the nose of someone who's, who's not following the way I believe on secondary issues and say, well, you're wrong and I'm right. God help us not to have that attitude. Now, if they're saying you can be saved by Buddha and you can be saved by following Islam, you can, there are multiple ways. Jesus is a way to heaven. Obviously, that is a debatable, not just a debatable, that is a, that's where you come in and say, listen, the Bible says this. Now, in debates that you might have over secondary issues, yeah, but if you do have a debate, don't be sarcastic, don't be judgmental, and don't be mean. If we're followers of Christ, hear what the other one has to say. As I preached on Sunday night, James, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Slow to anger. And then verse 7 of chapter 15 sort of sums it up. Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. To the glory of God. Now, our time is finished tonight. And uh, we talked about these three different levels, uh, the primary issues, the secondary issues, and the, and the tertiary issues, or level three issues. And what we have seen here in this particular situation is that, that we are, we're not always going to be in agreement. We should be in agreement on the primary issues. But on the secondary and third, third level issues, we have room for flexibility. And we may not be on the same page with other people. And folks, uh, I, I'm not talking about things that are written black and white in God's Word. Okay, God's Word does give us principles to help us to know how to judge what's right and wrong in our modern world today. But we need to, to with God's grace and His mercy and His compassion and allowing ourselves to communicate with our brothers and sisters who are not like we are on secondary issues filled with gentleness and meekness of spirit and humility and so may God help us as we look at this issue and go deeper next week into the actual uh, elements that are contained here and principles that will help us to know how to show our love for our brothers and sisters and the various things that we can encounter in the Christian world